that's me on the screen. Um, <laughs> my title is Education and Access Coordinator. Um, and we are so pleased to um, start this event by welcoming our keynote speaker, Judy Human, for a conversation. Um, hi, Judy. Um, hi. Can you see me? Because I can't see me. I can see you, Judy, yes. Okay. Um, I will stop screen sharing in just a second. Um, so Judy, as it says on the screen, is a lifelong civil rights advocate for people with disabilities. Um, she's featured in the Netflix documentary, Crip Camp, but that is far from her most um, uh, important achievement. Um, and we are so excited to, um, or I'm so excited to speak with her today. So I will stop screen sharing. Got it. All right. Hi, Judy. Hi. Nice to see you. Um, give me one second. Now I have to switch windows from my screen share. Um, all right. So the first thing that I wanted to talk to you about, Judy, is um, you've had such a long and, and storied career. Um, and so I just wanted to ask you about how have you seen the fight for disability rights and justice evolve over the course of your career? Thank you. Uh, let me first start off by describing myself. I'm probably one of the oldest people involved with this. Once upon a time, that wasn't true. So I'm 72 and a half, and I'm a white woman with um, dark hair, which needs to get colored. So there's a bunch of white that you can see in it. And I'm wearing a Frida Kahlo t-shirt because this was her birthday this week. Um, and I'm in the foyer of our apartment. And we have a lot of pictures on the wall, family pictures and other kinds of knickknacks and windows behind me with a lot of light coming in. So how have I seen changes over the years? Um, that basically, the first, after I introduce myself, could you tell me the question again? Of course. Um, so the question is, how have you seen the fight for disability rights and disability justice evolve over the course of your career? So I think over the course of my life, um, because I had polio in 1949, I was born in 1947. And um, at, at that age, obviously, I was not thinking of a career. And I would say one of the reasons why I really have immersed myself in disability rights work, which in the beginning wasn't called rights, it didn't have a real name. So that's an important part of the changes that have been going on in the United States and around the world. Um, my, my personal experience is like many of you who are uh, participating in this event, whenever you are identified as having a disability, um, it's our personal experiences that have in many ways um, had barriers put before us, um, literally and figuratively, uh, that have limited our lives to really dreaming about what it is we wanted to do. So, the changes that I think we've seen both in the United States and around the world is the beginning of disabled people mobilizing. And again, you know, from my perspective, uh, we didn't really have a movement to look back on. When you think about the women's movement, when you think about, um, the black movement, Latino movement, etc. You can really look for many, many, many years, decades, um, centuries at the work that was being done by disenfranchised groups and many, many organizations and family members and following in the foot tracks of other family members and friends, etc. But in the disability community, by and large, there are exceptions, you know, for the deaf community um, where deafness may be genetic and you have families, practically whole families who are deaf and deaf culture is just a part of their being. And in some cases, um, 
in the area of blindness also and some other disabilities, but as a rule, that's not the case. So for those of you who've watched Crip Camp, I think you know you see in Crip Camp, in my book, Being Human, and other books that are being written by disabled individuals, our growth. And for me, I think my growth and the growth of other disabled people at that period of time was very much being influenced by other movements. So the civil rights movement, which you know was really becoming uh, quite visible and uh, powerful in the 50s and 60s, the anti-war movement, the women's movement, the Gray Panthers, the senior movement, um, those movements were moving forward and we were, as younger disabled people, um, being very influenced by what we were seeing. And I think the opportunities to go to camps like Jeanette, but others also really afforded us an opportunity to both kind of be kids, be teenagers, have fun, date, um, you know, all the stuff that goes on when you're a teenager. But for many of us, uh, who were at the camp, we didn't have, our life at camp was not the same as our life at home. Um, because in camp, there was a limited geographical area. There were people there who could assist um, us in getting dressed, going to the bathroom, doing those things that, you know, for myself and most of my friends, if we needed help, we were relying on our families. So it, you didn't, I didn't really have the freedom to decide certain things because my mother was helping me and my brothers. So the evolution really um, has been coming about as we, as disabled people, begin to really see that our lives should not be different than someone else who doesn't have a disability, whatever the form of the disability may be and that we needed ourselves to be able to verbalize um, not only how we were feeling, exclusion, rejection, lack of opportunities because um, our schools, many of us were going to segregated schools, limited um, interaction with disabled people who were in work and uh, you know, moving, advancing within society. So I think as we were analyzing in part the medical model, the telethon model, where um, we were being portrayed also as what I call hopeless, selfless cripples that needed charity to cure us and to prevent us, that was all kind of going on in a storm. We were really looking at what we didn't want and what we did want. So in the 70s and 80s, and I think still till today, one of the things that we continue to address is the ability for those of us with many different types of disabilities to be able to come together as one. And by that, I don't mean that um, we are casting aside our disabilities and how they impact us as individuals, but rather I define it as we are experiencing discrimination. That's one of the other changes that's gone on. We use the word discrimination. We use the word justice and equality, civil rights, human rights. Those were words in the beginning of my life that were for others. Others were experiencing discrimination. And therefore you saw many years, decades of fighting for the Civil Rights Act, which did not include disability. The women's movement that was evolving, that was not including disabled women. And all of these others that we decided we needed to come together. We needed to learn about who we are, both as individuals, but then how our disabilities impacted our lives. So if you were deaf, what did you need? If you were blind, what did you need? If you had a physical disability, 
what did you need? What was discrimination? Laws began to evolve. Section 504 being one of the most important first ones that was passed in 1973, along with a number of other provisions under uh, Title V of the Rehab Act. A little point there was there was a disabled guy, a veteran, who worked with Senator Cranston. And it was he, with some of the other staffers, that was really pushing to begin to get legislation that paralleled other laws, like in the area of civil rights. And it necessitated us, when you look at 504 and the demonstrations that occurred, we were all needing to learn much more. We needed to go beyond discussing the barriers and the problems. We needed to have a vision of what could happen. And not only did we need to have a vision of what could happen, but, sorry about the clanking, but we also needed to develop knowledge and expertise that would allow us to be at the table um, discussing and arguing for things like accessible buses and interpreters and eventually captioning, things of that nature. So move it forward to today, I think we've seen the great work that was done in the passage of the Americans with Disabilities Act. I think, you know, when we look in 1977 is when the 504 regulations were signed. It was 13 years later that the Americans with Disabilities Act finally became a law. And one of the important parts of the passage of the ADA, in addition to what it does and says, was the fact that disabled people around the United States at the local, state, and national level were organizing. People were coming together, talking about learning disabilities, mental health disabilities, AIDS, physical disabilities, on and on and on. We were more effectively able to discuss discrimination. We were able to discuss the fact that the discrimination was not isolated. It, it occurred in every community, in every state. And we were able to engage a bipartisan group of legislators to agree that the magnitude of the barriers that we were facing did need to have a national law. And that really, I think, was a monumental, a monumental event in being able to get people together and really get the Congress to do this. In the last 30 years since the ADA, there have been many additional things happening. We've seen really a burgeoning of an international disability rights movement, um, impacting uh, disabled people around the world, learning from each other, sharing information. Um, the passage of the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities coming into effect in 2008, um, which has been very important on the international level, similar to the Americans with Disabilities Act, different but similar, um, which again came about for the same reason as the ADA disabled people at the local level and international level, really being able to come together to demonstrate that disabled people across the world were experiencing significant discrimination and that that discrimination was denying people opportunities to participate in social life, employment, um, just everyday activities stigma against those of us with disabilities, high unemployment rate, in many countries still high rates of disabled children not receiving education. So I think for me, summarizing this, we've seen the strengthening of our vision. We've seen as we have been successful in moving more laws forward, that our expectations and our demands for what more is needed is becoming uh, stronger. 
I think why I was interested in participating in this discussion today is because one of the major areas where we've not made the degree of um, advancement that I think is critical, not just for us, but for society overall is the media. Uh, disabled people are still, as you all know, not reflected um, in a significant enough way in, in media, in theater, in film, um, in journalism, on and on. And the work that you're all doing to really look at ways of including disabled people of all ages is so important because I believe it's intimate, it connects with people, it allows people to learn about the diversity of our communities. Um, it allows stories to be told. And the absence of that results in those of us with hidden and visible disabilities continuing to be marginalized. And I guess I think really another very critical issue is, you know, we talk in the United States about 61 million disabled people. And we talk internationally about 1 billion disabled people. Those are huge numbers, but the reality is we're not reflected anywhere um, in a public way uh, to allow people to learn about who we are, what our stories are, what our experiences are, or just to be a part of the general society um, in theater. You don't have to be playing a disabled role. You don't have to be writing about disability. It doesn't have to be a piece in a museum of a disabled person but our engagement and the diversity that we represent must be more front and center if, in my view, we're ever gonna really attain the level of inclusion, equity, justice that we are fighting for. Amazing, Judy, thank you. That was so insightful. Um, I have one more quick question for you and then we'll wrap up, but just, um, you know, you gave us such rich context about, um, you know, your history up until now and looking at sort of where we are now um, in the arts and culture field. And um, so now I'm sort of thinking about where we need to go for the future. Um, and so I was wondering if you could just offer, um, you know, a bit of advice maybe for the um, sort of post ADA generation, how we can sort of continue this fight for disability justice in the future. So I guess um, I know a lot of people are talking about the post-ADA generation, and we think about it as younger people. Um, I think it's important for us to recognize that disability is intergenerational. And the reason I think that's so important is so many disabled people acquire their disabilities as they're getting older. And one of the big problems is when you're raised in a society where disability is seen as a negative, and then you begin to have a disability yourself, it is likely that you're gonna perceive yourself in a negative way, not having the same rights, not, not wanting to be demanding, not engaging in the kinds of changes that you wanna see. You wanna live in your own home. You don't wanna to have to move out. You wanna be able to get whatever supports you need in your current environment. So. I think when we look at the um, ADA generation, I would like to look at it as an intergenerational generation. Um, younger people, I think, you know, as I speak to more younger individuals who maybe were born, you know, after 1990, 95, 96, 200, 2000, 2000, many of them don't even know what the ADA is. They don't know what 504 is. They may have learned about it later. They don't know about the movement. Um, they may be getting involved with it now, which is very exciting because people have felt alone. You know, as one woman told me last week, she's 28. Uh, she went, she is a wheelchair user and she uh, went to a regular school because the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act and 504 and the Americans with Disabilities Act had all been passed. So she was given opportunities, for example, that I wasn't. Um, but when she was like 15 or 16, she was invited to 
a, a youth leadership group of disabled individuals. And she said to me, when I went, I found my people. That was her language. And I think that's something that's not just for younger people. I think, you know, it's for people um, as they get older and in this case, acquire disabilities. So I really feel very strongly that those of you with disabilities who are engaged in media, uh, in theater, in the arts, and may feel alone in many ways, not yet having achieved what you are trying to achieve, recognize that your resilience um, and your vision and your ability to work with other people continues to transform society. And as terrible as COVID is, I think there are also lots of stories and opportunities that we can pull from this both the good and the bad, um, so that as we move forward, um, we can we can feel that our voices are being reflected, and that each of us, in our own way, individually and collectively, are really uh, fighting to move forward and redesigning not only the United States but the world. Social media allows us to connect with so many people that um, I just want to thank you for what you do every day. And I'm happy to be here. Thank you so much, Judy. That was really wonderful. So it's a joy to speak with you. Um, so thank you so much. Um, we're going to move on to the panel portion of our event now. Thank you. Um, thank you, Judy. Um, so I am thrilled to welcome to the Zoom stage um, five wonderful um, artists and arts administrators from across um, the theater, museum, arts and culture um, sector. Uh, our first panelist is Ezra Bennis. Um, he is a multi multidisciplinary artist, educator, and curator. Um, he, um, his art spans a range of themes for, such as time, care, pain, illness, and health. Um, and he um, is uh, also a curator at a number of um, arts institutions around the city. Um, our next panelist is Jerron Herman. Jerron is um, an interdisciplinary artist. He um, creates through dance, text, and visual storytelling. Um, and he has uh, been a performer with Heidi Latsky Dance. Um, our next panelist is Reagan Linton. Um, Reagan is the artistic director of Family Theater Company. That's family with a PH, um, and which is a, a theater company based in Denver um, that uh, reimagined reimagines established theatrical works um, exclusively with um, casts of disabled artists. Um, so we are thrilled to have her with us. Um, we also have Russell Hill. Um, Russell is a uh, meditation specialist with um, Job Path NYC, which is an organization that supports people with developmental disabilities. Um, and he also is an administrator at the Intrepid uh, Sea, Air, and Space Museum here in New York City. Um, and our final panelist is Alexandria Wales, who is a performer, director, um, who was most recently seen um, at the Public Theater in their um, revival of uh, For Colored Girls Who Have Considered Suicide, When the Rainbow is Enough. Um, so I am so excited to welcome this wonderful panel um, to this Zoom call with me. Their um, information is on the slide, which we will also be sending out after the event if you want to um, check them out some more online. I'm sorry, um, can you pause quickly um, for a glitch with our captioning? Absolutely. I think we are back. All right, thank you. Great, no problem. All right, so I think we can stop the screen share.
Great. And my first question is for the full panel. Um, and since this event is titled Disability Justice and the Arts, I thought it would make sense for us to just go around and just give a brief description of what, dis what disability justice means to you. Um, and Jaron, we can start with you. Cool. Thanks so much, Kristen. Um, I'm a black man uh, with uh, high kinky hair and a mustache. I'm wearing a white canvas t-shirt and I'm in my apartment. There are uh, plants festooned around me. Um, and the idea, um, thank you so much, Judy, for um, your words. Uh, they really do help me contextualize what I think about and feel about disability justice, um, especially in the sense that um, as, as I grew up, I was, um, I was tasked with understanding my disability in really functional ways. And so I think that um, the idea of disability justice is um, a process, is a way in which um, our ideas of access or of, um, of disability can be, expand, be expansive and elastic so that they, um, they get away from notions of, um, of, of uh, utilitarianism and then go into welcoming so that we understand that our creation of worlds is not just to uh, stave off punitive actions or the things that um, we want to, I guess, be hard on, but that we um, create spaces that incorporate folks who uh, do or do not look like us. Um, I was thinking about this and wondering whether or not access could be a welcoming questioning practice that expands our notion of our people that Judy just brought up uh, to include folks who are uh, just as interested in justice, culture, and not just those with a disability. So that we can move out of just like disabilities for disabled people. No, let's all think about it and how it interrogates our lives. I love that, Jaron. Thank you. Um, Ezra, what are your thoughts? Um, hi everyone, I'm Ezra. I am a white male presenting person. I have big black curly hair and uh, some scruff on my face. I'm wearing a black t-shirt and a red cardigan. I'm in my bedroom slash studio right now. So uh, in back of me there's a big white wall and uh, over my right shoulder you can see a frame with different colored uh, textile works. Uh, with pink and green and blue and white strands of, uh, of yarn on it. I'm making a rug. Um, so yeah, so to also think about, you know, what Jaron was just saying about welcoming and elasticity, I want to, I wanna move with that and say that disability justice from my learnings and from my understandings is something that has space that changes um, and that looks and learns from leaders who have been doing the work for a long time. And so primarily folks who are uh, black and indigenous and people of color and queer and trans folks uh, who have been doing this work, right? And have given us language, have given us space for us to even have a panel right now and talk about it. So just to name a few people that I've learned from uh, like Dustin Gibson, Mia Mingus, um, Patty Byrne, uh, one of the co-founders of Sins Invalid. They, there's a whole, um, prince, they have 10 principles of disability justice that, that they've written up. And so there's, I mean, there's so much work that has been done, right? And, and is continuing to be done and built upon. And so for me, um, disability justice means understanding the whole of, of issues in our society that impacts you know, me, that impacts you, that impacts them and us. And so how can we bring in all of the complexities of what it means to be human and to be marginalized and oppressed and also um, leverage certain privileges that someone might have, like that I might have, right? As a white male presenting person who is not always, who's passing as someone who is non-disabled. And so there's a lot that, you know, what it, for what it means to, to be working within a framework of disability justice, it means to always have people with me 
and um, being work and working with other people and, and, you know, and centering voices and work of people who are maybe less privileged in the ways that I am. Um, and so that's, that's really how I approach my work. Um, and again, like Jaron said, this, this idea of welcoming is something that's so beautiful to consider because it's like, how, how can, you know, we create a future if not everyone is welcome, right? It's the whole point of it is like, we're trying to welcome as many people as we can. Great. Thank you, Ezra. And thank you for sort of naming the people that are lifting us up as we do this work. Um, Those were only some. Those were a very few. That was not a comprehensive list by any means, um, but thank you for naming a few folks. Um, Alexandria, we can have you next. Hello, everyone. My name is Alexandria. I use sign language, American Sign Language, and who's voicing? I'm not sure who's voicing me. Oh, hi, Jacinda. You're voicing for me? Great. <laughs> so um, I am biracial, light skinned. Um, I am a white passing woman um, with dark, curly, straight hair, I'm wearing like a charcoal gray shirt, or in it's actually charcoal gray blue family shirt and a I'm wearing a pair of earrings in the shape of a U and I have uh, a light green colored nail polish on and I feel like my clothes are just very moody <laughs> so to speak um, right now. I have on the back of me a maroon colored wall and over my left shoulder I have a multicolored blanket and right up above that is a picture frame behind me. So now going back to disability justice, um, firstly, I just want to thank you all for inviting me to be a part of this um, conversation and uh, the 30th anniversary of American Disabilities Act. Um, uh, when I was a young teen, I remember that was when the ADA passed. And so it, I have like both experiences of pre-ADA passing and post-ADA. And so I feel like I can speak on both and really, um, being bi biracial and deaf um, and a political woman of color, uh, I felt like no matter what I did, it was always on uh, the receiving end of, of the uh, conversation about how I live or navigate in this world. And for me, disability justice is inclusive of everyone. Um, and, and, and it's led by members of the disability community. Um, and it's been, it's been, again, inclusive, it's been welcoming. Um, and people, who, or should be welcoming, sorry, I'm sorry for the mistake, and it should be, um, um, we need to include the uh, physical space uh, for all bodies. And that way we can recognize um, how architectural or the architecture can influence um, us. And for the larger part for me, it's, it's for me, uh, it's largely through the arts and politics as well. Um, and bringing those experiences in each of those worlds and sharing that with everyone, um, I feel like it's, it's an honor and a, a more, representative, more representative on all layers. Wonderful. Thank you, Alexandria, and thank you, Jacinda. Um, great. Uh, uh, Reagan, why don't you go next? Hi, everybody. I'm Reagan Linton. I am a white woman in her late 30s with a white shirt on and black glasses and short blonde hair. I am sitting in an office that is uh, has very bland white walls with um, bad fluorescent lighting. Um, and I use she, her, hers pronouns. And uh, yeah, I think this question of disability justice to me brings up what Judy was talking about in relation to what the other artists have talked about in terms of a place of welcome and the discrimination that folks have, have experienced in the past leads to dehumanization. And so I think it's just a very simple, important principle that people with disabilities are human. <laughs> We're human beings. And, um, 
and we're human beings in the same way that everybody else is human beings, just with different characteristics. And so I think particularly when we're thinking about art spaces, being aware of those subtle ways in which we are consistently dehumanizing people with disabilities. Um, it's dehumanizing when you're not considering putting a disabled artist on stage. It's dehumanizing when you're saying, oh, 70% of our exhibit is accessible, but not 100%. It's dehumanizing when you don't want to invest in a quiet room or ASL interpretation or captioning um, or a, a renovation to add more wheelchair seating. Those are all ways in which we reinforce that dehumanizing of people with disabilities. So when I think of disability justice, it's really about how can we change our attitudes and also our practices to rehumanize people with disabilities so that we are valuing them. We are saying you have value in the same way that non-disabled people have value. Wonderful. Thank you, Reagan. Um, and let's close it out with Russell. Hello, thank you for having me here. So my name is Russell, I have autism, I'm white, I have black hair and, and eyes that actually shift color right now, they're green. And I'm wearing a charcoal t-shirt and I have one of my paintings in the background. So yes, uh, I uh, wrote some notes on disabilities justice. I think it's about advocacy and accessibility and that uh, part of having justice is the very basic is getting into the building, being accessible. And I think it's also very important that we advocate for one another. And a lot of it is just how we see people with disabilities. There's so much bias and dogma and all this stuff. And we need to see that people with disabilities are capable and can hold good jobs, can have families, can do all sorts of things that everyone else can. So I wanna, I'm, and I'll get more on it later, I wanna see organizations hiring people at all levels with disabilities. And I wanna see people in the board of directors and vice presidents, presidents, good entrepreneur with all sorts of disabilities and all sorts of backgrounds. So I wanna not just talk about disability, but also capability, because a lot of people with disabilities are so capable in other ways. And some people even have gifts that are aligned with their disabilities. And I just really want to see people not underestimating us um, and just knowing that we can work well at a job. We can be a great girlfriend, boyfriend, uh, non-binary friend, uh, and uh, that we can be represented everywhere, like, like, uh, like, in the media, everywhere, give us a chance. You know, we're, go we're gonna do well. I believe in people with disabilities. Wonderful. Thank you, Russell. And thank you all of you um, for your words on that. Um, I want to, as we're thinking about justice, I wanna think about how that applies to the cultural institutions that are here in the Zoom room with us today. Um, and I wanna talk a little bit as a group about equity, diversity, and inclusion that lovely phrase, EDI, one might say, um, something that is so um, prominent in cultural institutions these days. Um, and I wanna talk a little bit, we don't have to speak in any particular order, I'll just sort of open up the room. Um, if we could talk a little bit about, um, you know, how do you feel when you see um, these institutions that are often predominantly white, predominantly non-disabled, um, putting out these EDI statements? Um, and how, do you feel that these organizations can, you know, prove their commitment not just to this sort of nebulous diversity and inclusion, but to true justice? That's a big question. Whoever wants to kick it off. I just want to say something very brief. I see almost every website has one of these, but until you see people in your vice presidents, your board of directors, balanced employment, support, uh, accessibility, like, I'm not going to take that seriously. So show show it. And even if you can on your website, I'd love to see our company is uh, balanced and race and everyone gets an opportunity for every position. If you can actually show that, that's better than just saying stuff. Yes, thank you. And we're going to pause for one second to switch out interpreters. All right, welcome, Craig. And continue. Uh, 
I'll, I'll say something. Oh, Jaron, do you want to go? Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, I think, you know, EDI statements are a great first step. I mean, there, there's nothing bad about an inclusive, you know, EDI statement, but then you have to be thinking about how are you actually backing it up? Where is the representation that you're, you know, striving for? Um, and particularly within institutions, how are you maybe, um, uh, how, how are you encouraging or discouraging, uh, particularly within the context of disability, the visibility of somebody with a disability, whether it's invisible or not, how are you encouraging them to be able to come out and say, yes, I do have this disability, I need this kind of accommodation. Um, and is that part of this statement? You know, How are you backing it up in values? So I think it just, EDI statements are a great first step, but then you have to think about how are you putting them into practice? Um, and just one statement I keep coming back to that I heard recently is it's it's not a revolution if it's not accessible and so as you're building your edi all of your edi work if you're not making it accessible then it's not fully revolutionary hi this is ezra speaking uh i I want to address the fact that we're we're currently in a landscape where cultural institutions, whatever we thought of or whatever we're thinking of, uh, what a cultural institution or organization is, I think we do need to um, kind of like throw that out because we're at a, a moment where there's no there's no going back, right? There's no there's no um, way that we can proceed with programming with um, with DEI plans or anything without taking into account the fact that the world landscape around employment, around safety, around health, around participation, you know, around um, actual equity for the people who work there, like that, those are the things that need to be addressed first and foremost. So what, what I've been seeing from my perspective as someone who freelances and moves, you know, between art institutions as my own person, uh, I, what I've seen is, you know, a lack of um, understanding that, that people are, that the workers are people. So, you know, and, and seeing that there is a lack of commitment to education still, right, always has been. If we talk about access, we can talk about where access lives within cultural institutions, which is often in education departments. Um, but when we see education being cut in many ways, Right, we, we also have to understand that, you know, often that is like part of the only ways disabled people um, have access to institutions. And we're, we also have to consider the fact that now so many people who have been working at cultural institutions, right, can't, can't afford to or, um, you know, have been laid off, right, in, in ways that I'm talking about, like, this is, a, this is gonna be a ripple effect because so much of how cultural institutions have been operating, which is on this freelance, part-time, you know, flexible kind of contracting with arts workers and with artists. And now we're at a point where, of course, all of that is gone. And so the folks who are still employed by and large are in leadership. So back to what Russell was saying is like, if we don't understand disability uh, justice as the actual framework for uh, for something, you know, or as R Reagan was just saying, as revolutionary, you know, like, we're never going to change. We're never going to have a real true commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion, and accessibility institutions. So um, I know it's hard to hear, but like, I do, I do really think that like, there needs to be a really deep, uh, a deep look at what, what the landscape is right now, and like, what it might be. And so how do we ensure that, that we're actually like, not telling people who might still have jobs that they need to come in if they have someone who lives in their home who is immune compromised, right? Like it's not just about the people who work there. Now I'm experiencing this right now on a very personal level, you know, like what does it mean to be an artist right now? What does it mean to be, um, you know, basically stuck inside for this whole calendar year, if not longer, um, and in terms of participation. So yeah, I know I, I can continue going off and, um, Jaron and I often talk about that, like I can get started and won't stop, but I'm going to, um, and hope that, you know, we can build off of this and have real reflection on this. Yeah, I mean, 
Ezra, I'm like so for you, or this is Jerron speaking, I'm so for you on so many levels, um, you need to keep going. Because actually, I, in my experience, I've been thinking about uh, exactly what Russell's been talking about in terms of um, what it takes to really employ diversity at an institution. Um, as I sit on a board, I've been in a, um, I've been on, on panels, I've served in different capacities in like, you know, those, those spaces that we're supposed to get to, you know, and unfortunately, the culture is not, um, has not met the diversity yet. Like it's, I mean, it, there's nothing to, for me to, you know, do or give or get for being on a board, for example, but it's the fact that I am at the lower rung of income at already that I even then to participate in that function in that class is is different for me than my peers. So in experiencing that, there is this way in which you, if you want people to come to the table, um, you know, how is the table set really? And I think that the barriers to coming in power actually are more insidious than we're giving credit to. Um, I think that sometimes uh, nonprofit organizations don't really assess how tied to capitalism we really are. And though I would never, you know, I think that both, uh, I think that the framework of capitalism has very advantageous um, uh, alignments. And I would never say like, it actually is people that make it bad or people that make it good. And so I, I think though, um, as a framework nonprofit industry in the comp and the complex of nonprofit industry um, hides behind a charitable exterior. <laughs> And then therefore isn't, isn't, um, isn't up for critique and isn't up for how we can be, it'd be, it'd be more effective. And so this is why welcoming, this is why uh, DEI is not, you know, a package, but it's like step one D, step two E, step three I, and in different versions of that, because um, it's not one size fits all. And it does need to accord, correspond with what your organization looks like and also who you're serving and who's coming to the table. So there are a lot of different components that um, need to be um, diversified in the way that like you don't, like no, no one industry or no, no one company or organization or institution can do the same thing and call it um, equitable. Alexandria. <laughs> This is Alexandra speaking. I mean, I don't have much to add besides um, what um, Jerome was just saying. I mean, again, this is not a, a critique, but more an observational opportunity. I mean, we have um, the organizations, institutions use numbers or statistics, right? And once they satisfy those statistics, then they're good for the next five years until they have to um, recalibrate those numbers. And it's not, um, I mean, it's a it's a revolutionary attempt, I would say. But I mean, with COVID happening and quarantine happening, I mean, the first thing that we have to adapt to is is techn technology, right? We have to use Zoom, and our communication was um, um, compromised. I mean, if you don't have Wi-Fi or high speed, I mean, it, it might be affected, right? Um, and imagine those other people who don't have the same um, access or you know financially are able to have those um, connections and so we have like a a usual way of or or a way that we fix things and it's usually like i'm sorry we, ha we don't have a way to fix things um and we have to keep adapting and and making see if see if what we apply works and what doesn't work um, until we get closer to more um, a better way um, or overall better experience you know and again what I mentioned earlier about architectural spaces like in the arts and culture and things like that wonderful thank you thank you all um, and I want to I want to highlight something that Ezra said about um, you know just people being furloughed during this time. It just made me think about how right now often the first positions to be cut are the internships, the fellowships, the entry level positions, which 
are often where the sort of diversity in organizations comes in, which is its own problem that can be a whole different panel to talk about. Um, but that was just something that, um, that I thought of while you all were speaking. Um, okay, uh, moving along, I wanna focus a little bit more on the sort of artist experience at cultural institutions. Um, and Ezra, I think you touched about this a little bit just when you were talking about how you hop around from institution to institution. Um, but Jaron and Alexandria as artists as well, um, I wondered if you could speak a little bit about um, the sort of shift that we've seen over the past few months and what your relationship with cultural cultural institutions was like before <laughs> the events of the past few months and what it's like now. Yeah, Alexandria. Hi, this is Alexandria speaking. Uh, I would say I'm very fortunate as a freelance um, artist I've been teaching at a few uh, museums throughout the city of New York. Um, and ever since COVID, um, I would say I'd average about three or four um, sign language leaders or um, tours, I'm sorry, tours. Um, and I've had about, since COVID happened, um, I've had one tour in American Sign Language since February. Um, and fortunately, I mean, we were able to do it through Zoom, which that experience was wonderful, but because of the financial um, depletion, it, 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 it makes sense. Um, the funds of access for education of, is, of course, to be the first to go. Um, so I know there are other museums out there who are still um, doing their virtual tours which is wonderful, uh, but I do wonder how, um, what the maximum experience of those kind of virtual tours would be because the textual or the, the, um, the texture aspect is, is missing um, with speaking in sign language um, in person in 3D versus 2D, it's, it's a different experience overall. And, and so we have to learn how to lead in those kind of platforms to have other people experience uh, the most they can. This is Jaron. Um, people want to dance in their homes. <laughs> so I've been a little bit more uh, employed, if you will say. Um, there is though um, a quality of immediacy that I think has been a little um, hard to deal with as we individually have to um, come to terms with this time and as cultural activators or as people who make things, um, the response of institutions to uh, give them a new avenue to express themselves through the artists has been something I've been internalizing. Um, how deadlines have really shifted, how deadlines have really shrunk and um, the creative process is a little strained for it. Um, and the ways in which we, um, the ways in which we create, I mean, I'm creating in my bedroom or I'm creating in the kitchen or I'm creating in the, in the hallway. I did a, a, I did a bathtub solo for an artist in the UK. It's just, I think in, in some ways this is uh, uh, beautifully narrating uh, a, um, a disability experience where we, those who are usually sequestered or usually synced at home um, now have um, the the permission, if you will, to see them see their homes as like as places of of, of high art making, um, just like community aspects of art have now kind of passed the passed the test of uh, of high art. So I'm excited about that. I think that we all got really frenzied uh, for solutions. Um, and that affected the artists. Yeah, this is Ezra speaking. Um, I think both Alexandria and Sharon just brought up really great points, which are, you know, just the recognition of limitations that we as artists also have in, in approaching making work or participating with and for cultural um, organizations and institutions. And also 
what would be really nice to see are some uh, maybe some like uh, admittance or admission by cultural institutions or by organizers to say we also have limitations right now um, and not to expect the same from artists right to produce something and but to understand that like to really think about what it means to be a disabled artist is to really understand that flexibility is always an aesthetic right is always part of the process and so how can we also like continue to shift with with the ways like we are also so tied to cultural organizations for producing our work like th this is something that's only unfolding right now um and like Jaron said, you know, I'm, I'm kind of always working in my bedroom or, you know, there has been like some really interesting moments for me to realize that like, oh, my pain levels have gone down a little bit because I'm not required to show up physically in certain ways or participate in certain ways. And then, you know, that quickly kind of back, back ends to thinking about the ways that so many of us have had to, before this experience, have had to push ourselves to beyond our physical and mental and you know body mind limits to participate. Um, so I do think there's something that's like you know very revealing of of what it means to be an artist. Period. Right now and like how how and who is shifting and adapting and how and who has support to do that and who doesn't. Right. So I think we also need to like recognize who's also not being brought in to these conversations in this moment right like we're we also have to understand the, the different ways that you know the arts has so much impact outside of cultural organizations and institutions like what are what are we thinking about art in terms of you know folks who are incarcerated right now of folks who are um, hospitalized right now like where is the ways that we think about art for a public like how can we also expand that in a time when we're also kind of being more intimate in our own spaces, right? And I think that's a challenge that I'd put to all of the cultural institutions who, you know, by the people who, who have power to shift those things. Um, you know, I'm, yeah, I think it's, it's a lot for artists to suddenly have to solve things, um, you know, for everyone. So it would also be great to, you know, have some solutions being promoted by institutions with and with uh, conversations by disabled artists, right? And I think this is a start, yeah. Wonderful, thank you all for sharing. Um, and Reagan, I'm wondering after hearing um, from all of these artists about their experiences, how, how you and how family as a um, disability focused, disability led organization has adapted to this current moment. Um, and how you're thinking about the future and serving your artists and your community. Yeah, well, this is Reagan. Um, first of all, <laughs> as Ezra was just saying, I mean, you have multiple artists right here on this Zoom that you could be involving in those conversations as you start to, you know, rebuild, figure things out. Um, and, you know, that could be somewhere where you place resources. Um, I think, well, let me backtrack a little bit. Um, Ironically, Family was supposed to produce Alice in Wonderland this summer, and that's the show that we had to postpone. But our tagline for the show this summer was gonna be Embrace the Madness. So it seems more appropriate than ever. <laughs> um, and I think really, if I think about how we are how we are working with this current moment, it is that, it is embracing the madness. And I think Family's very familiar with that, as Ezra was saying, um, for those of us with disabilities, flexibility is, is often mandatory for us to do our work. Um, and that's a great skill, adaptation and flexibility. And so that's a skill where we're able to employ that right now um, uh, in this moment where we're all having to be, be flexible. And so I think, you know, there was that initial shock as there always is there, and not that that also doesn't turn into kind of consistent and chronic shock, trauma, pain, um, but I think, as you are creating the healing, you know, you can't rebuild something until it's been torn down. So right now is the moment of tearing down. Um, and as we are thinking about starting to rebuild and family is, is right there with all of the other institutions of thinking, you know, what, what can we be doing better? Um, how can we be, you know, have we been feeling like we're stuck in a status quo of a certain type of work for years and years and years, and we've always wanted to disrupt that, but never felt like we had the opportunity. So what, 
in this moment, where is that opportunity to disrupt? I know everybody, all of you out there right now are probably looking at your budgets, thinking about how are you reallocating? How are you making things work? So what a great you know, moment to say, oh, those things that we've always said, we don't have the budget to do that, or we don't have the budget category, build it. Um, so, uh, you know, and then I guess just in terms of our programming, we have largely transitioned to online programming and, you know, thinking about doing things we've never done before. We're collaborating actually with Queens Theater right now. Um, we thought we have, we have artists with disabilities in Denver. You have artists with disabilities in New York. Why are we, and now we're all in a virtual space, then why are we not cross-pollinating? Um, we're looking at doing our, our first fully virtual fundraiser in uh, October that is a kind of somebody mentioned the telethon um, charity model earlier, I think Judy, and it's going to be a kind of tongue in cheek, sarcastic uh, take on the Jerry Lewis telethon and, you know, free and available. Um, so there's boom access right there. Um, so I think, you know, we're trying to just embrace that madness, embrace that this moment where we're all thrown off and it's across the board. It's not just folks with disabilities. We're all experiencing that, um, that disruption in our foundation. So how can we, you know, get past the fear and move into the boldness, move into the risk taking of, okay, this is the moment. Um, I think that's from, a, this is the moment. I don't remember what musical that is, but uh, how can we use this as a moment of opportunity? Yeah, it's always like this. <laughs> Thank you, John. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> this is the moment for us to, to treat it as an opportunity to be bold um, and, and realize we're all going through that same fear. So how do we also operate in the ways as we are supposed to as artists collaboratively and come together and say, I don't know what the hell I'm doing. Let's, let's talk about it. Let's figure it out and let's start to rebuild. Amazing. Thank you, Reagan. Um, I think we're going to switch out interpreters. Great. Bye, Craig. Hi, Carly. Um, all right. Yes. Thank you, Reagan. That was some really wonderful insight. I'm sure all of the organizations on this call were furiously taking notes. Um, uh, so I want to uh, talk to Russell. I want to talk to you a little bit. Um, I was super excited to get you on this panel because you're somebody who's sort of newer to arts administration um, and has just recently entered the field. And I think I'm really interested in hearing your perspective um, as you've entered the field so recently. Um, what are some barriers that you've faced um, as you've been seeking arts employment? Oh, you're muted, Russell. Well, first of all, I'm very privileged because I had um, Mac to help me. I had things, Access VR. I have a lot of services that a lot of people have a lot of trouble getting. So I got lucky with that. When I was applying, I had definitely come across jobs where they didn't tell me or it wasn't straight up, but I could tell they were like, oh, look at that guy. He's different. Something's different about him. So I don't know. I don't know. We're not, we're going to put him aside. We're not going to take him seriously. At the Intrepid, well, the Intrepid has been a very good place to me. And um, thankfully, I have a job coach because from Job Path, because there are some social things I just didn't get. Like, there's a whole new culture to working at an arts place and you got to kind of like know certain inner things. And that was very hard for me. I also, when I was, deal I did a lot of like spreadsheets and entering information and research and it's very hard for my dysgraphia. And I had to get used to it. I actually had to train myself to get, and I think it really helped me get over my dysgraphia. And then also and some people, when you get it to the office, they, there's this like, I know I feel like it's kind of like a, 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 a like a like a standard, but like that, that no one can ever achieve, but they hope that you achieve it. They say you can't make a mistake, and it's like impossible not to make a mistake ever when you're doing spreadsheets and you're doing office work and admin work. So you know, like that was a big thing that I really needed to. But it got me to think about things that make me make less mistakes. On the other hand. Like I could like double, I would think like, oh, I don't want to be on my uh, end of year report. So I might as well double check it, triple check it. Uh, wait, I'm losing focus. I'm going in my own head. I'm just doing it with my subconscious. Be present. Double. I wasn't, you know, I was starting to lose a little bit of focus. Look over everything. 
and it actually was really good for my growth as well as that. But it's, you know, it's a lot of pressure to just let the work world is like, there's all these unwritten ex things that you're just supposed to have to know. So, but the Intrepid's been super nice and patient with me. So I thank them for that. Yeah, and I wonder, Russell, based on all of those experiences that you've had, what do you wish arts organizations would do to support people with disabilities entering the field? I just want to see more access positions, full-time access positions, uh, you know, upward movement for people with disabilities in the, in the institution. I want to see people with disabilities uh, in, in high ranks at companies. It's not just arts, it's everywhere. We're all, we're, we're mostly at the bottom right now. And uh, we need, you know, I want to also see people with disabilities who want their own place to be able to have enough money to support themselves. Maybe some people now, I know not everyone wants this, want a wife or a husband or a non-binary husband or wife or to, uh, and kids. And they just really want that. But it's so hard with this economy and especially with this thing where, uh, you know, 99% of, well, I don't want to give a percentage, but a lot, the majority, it seems, of disability, people with disabilities are at the very, are assistants and, and uh, entry level and not as many bosses. And certainly, I don't know, because maybe there's people I don't know about who aren't disclosing or who are very invisible up at the top, and maybe I'm wrong. And I'm sure there are invisible disabilities and people who don't disclose, but I think we need to see more people. And you know, you know, we need to know that there are people with disabilities everywhere in the rung, and people with disabilities as they advance and they get older. I'm 28, like you know, are making livable wages. And I want to see this for other, you know, for for women, people of all races, trans people that we have. That we all because they're facing the same issue and then some people are facing multiple biases so i want to see see everyone you know having equal opportunities yeah wonderful thank you russell um and i think it's really important you know you're talking about how maybe there are some people with invisible disabilities higher up but they don't disclose um i think it's important to you know create an environment where you know, people don't feel like they have to, you know, hide their disability in order to achieve a higher up position or in order to succeed in this field. You know, I think that is part of this disability yes. that we're striving towards. Exactly. Um, all right, so we're running a little short on time, so I'm gonna skip ahead to my final question. Um, and this is a question for all of you. Um, and I wanna just reflect on the fact that we are currently at or very close to the 30th anniversary of the ADA. Um, and I wonder if we can go around and just talk a bit about um, what we hope to see next. Um, you know, what lessons do you want cultural institutions to take from this time that we're in, from this conversation we just had, um, and to carry with them into the future? Um, and how do you want them to lead with disability justice in their work? going forward. Um, and Russell, we can start with you. Yes, so I feel like with artists, there's so many people with disabilities who have different ways of thinking, their own talents, their own capabilities. You know, I've been at, you know, I've been in art shows on a very local, small level, but I want to see big museums, big museums um, hosting artists with disabilities. And um, I just want to see people focusing on the capabilities, disability capability, the other side, how we can hire these people based on their capabilities and not just at the bottom. So I want to see a focus on capability and different ability. And I want to see, you know, accessibility everywhere should be accessible by right now. I, you know, ADA came out a long time ago. I don't see why we don't why we're so still so inaccessible. And I just want to see community. And I see so much community and so many amazing people with disabilities really advocating for themselves. And it's time to give us the opportunities and apply our skills. Wonderful, Russell. Thank you, um, Alexandria. Uh, 
I think it's important. Yeah, I, I totally validate you, Russell, on what you just said. Um, I think it's important to us to see more people in higher positions, people with um, visible disabilities and non-visible disabilities. Um, and we have people, right, who are behind the scene um, and they are involved in the art scene, either administration or other roles like that, and who have uh, a typical way of life. Um, and they, they see things that happen every day. Um, and, hold on one sec, sorry, interpreter. Yes. Oh, thank you, Craig. Um, and so again, for the people both on the scenes or kind of like are the face of the organizations or the people who are behind the scenes running the program, um, curators or um, they need to be more diverse or the those kind of roles actually become, um, Craig, do you mind turning off your microphone? Oh, thank you, Craig. Thank you, Craig. Um, so uh, also, I, my other two points was that if you have a diverse representation out in front of the house, it becomes not a unique experience, but your daily experience. And we might also consider mentorship programs, programming to help bring in more people um, and help sort of our social elevation as well. I feel like it, it, a lot of times people it, with disabilities move horizontally rather than vertically, right? And we wanna change that. We don't see them in higher positions. The mentoring programs would help with that. For those who have a lot of experience could offer support, encouragement, and give new people opportunities for the light. Let them be seen. Um, it's our gain, we all gain in skills, skill building that way. And then it's not only unique to ourselves, it becomes a part of the social fabric. And I think maybe, you know, we can think both in terms of short term, long term gains, operations of um, uh, so that we can incrementally make changes, we can mark these changes. I think it's great that it won't, we need to see changes immediately. But I think we have to move beyond the checklist and think where we want to be in 10 years. And we have to be able to mark those changes. And it means that we're, it's going to, we're going to need to be persistent in making those changes happen. Exactly. Thank you, Alexandria. And thank you to our interpreters. Um, Reagan, why don't we hear from you next? Yeah, I just want to echo or lift up the mentoring um, or mentorship programs. I think that's absolutely right. And training. Um, and, and so just that goes to the whole, the whole idea of presence and uh, presence in institutions. Um, again, the room where it happens, you're not going to be able to kind of shift things until you have those people represented in the room. Um, and through that, I think, you know, or in conjunction with that, a pride, a pride and a lifting up of the disability identity of the culture. Um, allowing people that space to say, yes, I have a disability and I'm not going to be punished for it. I'm not going to be fired for it. Um, I'm not going to be discounted for it. Um, and yeah, and then I think, I think one, one thing, I'll, the final thing I'll throw out is just, you know, we don't have convening spaces for people who are outside of a particular locale to come together, particularly disabled artists. Um, you know, you have lead, but that's not focused on artistry. We need something where disabled artists can actually convene, share ideas, come together. And so if anybody out there wants to host it someday, <laughs> please do, because we have pockets where people are working in Phoenix, in, you know, Los Angeles, in Chicago, in Denver, in New York, but we, we never have the opportunity to kind of come together and convene and, and um, build that energy together. So I would love to see that. Yeah, that's wonderful. Someone make that happen out there in the, in the Zoom black void. <laughs> um, all right, pause for one second for interpreters. Getting better lighting, I think. Thanks, Great. Carly. 
All right. Thank you, Carly. Um, all right. Why don't we hear from Ezra next? Great. Thank you. This is Ezra speaking. I uh, So yes to everything everyone was saying. Uh, I think mentorship, social and you know artistic shared space is really important. Uh, and I also want to bring up uh, something that I don't think is always talked about, but often um, in my experience as a disabled artist, I'm, I'm often approached, you know, just by myself. And then I'm always left to, to ask the question, so what have you already been doing with disabled artists? Who else are you currently working with? Is there space for with your ask to me to bring someone else on together i think you know my my understanding of you know what what disability justice means is really um it is community oriented and it, it it means making within community and with and with and by and for community first and foremost and so i want there to be a commitment to you know less solo shows you know of of one of one chosen disabled artist that is often maybe constantly elevated or you know given opportunities not because they don't you know because they're amazing but there's so many of us that are amazing right so how can we how can we create space where like we're brought up all together right at the same time where it's not you know the kind of gatekeeper mentality within the art world that persists but how can we say um cool Ezra we want you to do something and who can you bring with you right and like make that put that into the budget lines like reagan was saying right like rework it um think about how we can also like put it onto the you know disabled artists also who who are creating already knowing so much so many other folks right like we have specific knowledge and and contacts and um understandings of what we want to do all together so that would be uh, you know something i would love to see moving forward in the the landscape of arts in general um you know, because we as individuals are really, we're, our time here is fleeting, right? But like what's not fleeting is the way our impact altogether um, is really, you know, going to stay, going to last. I mean, we saw this from having Judith Human speak, right? Someone who's been involved her, her whole life around this and now we get to talk about it. And I want us to like understand that it also wasn't just Judith Human, right? It wasn't, it's not just me. It's not just Geron. Like there's so much, there's so much rich, culture that we need to like bring um, and continually bring up. And when I say like together, it needs to be like multiple people at once. Um, so that's what I would task us with. Yeah. And then of course, you know, access in every, in every point of like any kind of work. So like not just an education and yeah, I'll leave it at that. Thank you, Ezra. If we could have had 50 people on this panel, we would have, <laughs> would have taken a little too long, I think. Um, all right, Jaron, why don't you close us out? Hey, uh, thank you so much. And thank you everyone uh, for what you just said, because it really energizes me, um, makes me dream and think expansively. Because I, what I'm considering now as like something that institutions can take hold of is, um, is their heart. Um, there, <laughs> there's the heart of an institution, there's the heart and the, the, the the, the draw, the uh, impulses that every institution culture has. And um, I'd be really excited and curious to see how you authentically engage your art with the lens um, and uh, the disability lens. Um, and because then we'll get that uh, variety. Um, uh, the, I, I experienced this with, um, the curation, development, um, and performance execution of this uh, dis dis disabled-led uh, experience called I Want to Be With You Everywhere, a performance-based New York. And what was so unique about it was not just uh, its inclusion of disabled actors, performers, um, as uh, in the front end, but its, its caring, its care uh, around the whole event and around its um, around its uh, the, the, the own organization's priorities, especially for that event, but um, which was key. But I think that there was this next commitment to, we, we tried in a microcosm to create this, the, the, the biggest 
<laughs> the biggest idea of access culture that we could, including folks, including voices. And then based off of what we learned in that instance, right? Like really taking it, really settling in it, settling in the discomfort of getting it wrong as well. Settling in the, uh, the ways in which you were taught, but also uh, understood how your own culture or your own institution makes some, some things happen like a care room, like uh, sliding scale pay to come to the event, like um, uh, like good pay for artists, like these things were interconnected. So I would just say that for institutions, um, you, I would, I, you need to have authentic engagement and, and understand how your institution, your heart can match the lens or else it'll just be performative and you'll get the notches, you'll get the check marks, you'll, you'll do the D to the E to the I or some element of it, but the, uh, the way in which it will be sustainable for us and how we'll start to feel comfortable, uh, meaning the disability community, is we'll see you um, match your own interests and your own curiosities and your own prowess with our prowess and our own genius. Um, no, noticing that that's a partnership and as Ezra said, um, the, some of the disability justice principles of like interdependence and um, and uh, well yeah interdependence is a huge one it's it's understanding that you it's not just you that we rely on but that you rely on us and you rely on your community um, and so I I'd love I'd love to see institutions take that on individually and how they see fit um, knowing what's at stake yeah, so would I. Just pausing to see who our interpreter is so I can spotlight. Uh, um, that's in the room. Great. If, if you can find me. Yeah. Am I supposed to be here? You are. Everyone is uh, back together. Oh, got it. Finding one next. On my screen, I'm at the top. <laughs> oh, thank you. Great. All right. Well, welcome back, everybody. Um, and we are just going to close out. And if um, Alex, you could share these slides. This is Alex. Let me get that for you right now. And while we do that, I believe Carly is going to switch to be our interpreter so we can find Carly and spotlight. Thank you, Carly. This is Alex. Can you see my screen okay? Yes, thank you. Great. This is Elisa, and I just wanted to um, thank everybody for coming and thank everybody for sharing oh, okay. all their reflections. Um, this event was the first in a series of events that Mac is hosting um, for the 30th anniversary of the ADA. So we hope you'll join us for our upcoming events. I do realize that some of them are already sold out. So we, um, uh, you know, encourage you to join the waiting list and hope that more spots become available. Um, so we have a people's history of the ADA next Wednesday, July 15th at 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. We have disability studies and self-advocacy in the cultural field on Wednesday, July 22nd at 5 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. We have a virtual reading of Emily Driver's Great Race Through Time and Space on Wednesday, July 29th at 2 p.m. And um, you can also submit to be one of Mac's uh, artist spotlights on our Mac ADA 30 website and social media. 
all this information can be found on um, macaccess.org slash ADA hyphen 30. Um, and I just wanna thank Art New York for being Mac's partner on this event, for, to Kirsten for moderating the event and to all our panelists, panelists and to Judy Human um, and to everybody who came and shared their thoughts and experiences. Thank you very much.